believe there's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. Oh. Just one word, just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a prison wall. For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe. For greater things, there's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like his power. There's nothing that our God can't do. There's not a mountain that he can't move. Oh, praise the name. Wonderful to be here with you this morning. So we just sang a song, There's Nothing Our God Can't Do. And the verse that came to mind with this song for this morning is in Ezekiel. And it is in chapter 37. And God is speaking to one of the prophets of Israel. Uh, and he gave him a vision. And in this vision, um, God showed him this valley that was full of dry bones. And obviously, I mean, we throw away bones on a regular basis, right? Just kick them out. Put them in the trash can. We never see them again. So we don't have much expectation for bones. And God said, son of man, can these bones live? Talk about a bizarre question. But this very wise prophet said, oh, sovereign Lord, only you know. And then God said, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. And the rest of the chapter, the prophet said what God told him to say. And the dry bones stood up and became a mighty army. And you guys, I just feel like there are people here that feel like they're just dry bones. They feel like there's no way that this could ever live again. There's no way 
that they could be an army, that there could be hope, um, that there could be a life. And God is saying, hear the word of the Lord this morning. There's nothing that I can't do, and you will come to life again. Um, so Jesus, we just ask that for every person here, we ask for every person that's online, logging in and watching, God, we ask that your breath, the breath of your presence, Holy Spirit, would breathe again, that our hearts would breathe, that our souls would breathe, that breath of life, you would stir your life inside of us, that we would stand boldly before you. Just like I said in Ezekiel, then you will know that I am the Lord. Thank you for your presence in this place. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
our eyes and our voices to you this morning. Jesus, thank you 
for your life, your death, and your resurrection. Thank you that we can come boldly into your presence. Thank you for the peace, the healing, the life that is found here with you. We give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name. Good morning, Revive. It is September. That means it's hunting season. I mean fall, pumpkin spice season. I'm, it, if you're out bow hunting and you watch this later online, I'm not shaming you. <laughs> so uh, quick announcements uh, this morning. Um, if you are new or haven't done so uh, and you've been here a few times, um, we have uh, connection cards and newcomers packets in the back. Um, tells us a little, tells you a little bit about us, and then if you fill out that connection card, we're able to keep track of you and get you plugged in. And also, if you have any needs or any prayer requests, you can also throw those on there so we know how to uh, help out if there is a need out there. Um, youth starts back up next Sunday here at 6 p.m. So if you are in <clears throat> sixth grade and 11 years old, you are now in youth. And you get to come on Sundays and party with Buck and Jamie. And now if you are going into kindergarten this year, now you get to go into the big room. So, because today is promotion Sunday, and then if you are three years old and your parents want to send you off to uh, children's church, they are now in the side room over in the big building. So. Uh, it's promotion Sunday. If that's not clear, see Bree, and she will get you sorted out. She knows this way better than I do. Um, connection groups are starting up next weekend, and we have a bunch of them. I checked online this morning, and there is nine. There is nine different uh, groups that we are putting out this year uh, for people to join up in throughout the week. Uh, we're going to be meeting at different places. Uh, you don't have to go to all of them. If you are that person, though, uh, by all means, <laughs> do, do, do the full gamut of it. I mean, that, I mean, you don't get extra credit, but, I mean, it, uh, good on you. Um, and they can be found at uh, revive dot, or revivemt.org. And if you go there to the Bitterroot homepage, all you have to do is click on the uh, picture that looks just like that, and it will bring up the full list, where they're meeting, who's doing what, and uh, kind of a blurb of what it's all about. Um, if you are uh, planning on attending the women's study, your homework has begun already, the Tuesday night one. Because on Tuesday night, uh, you need to have read Exodus chapter 1 and be prepared to talk about it. So homework begins already, ladies. <laughs> Men, we don't have homework. We, ha we have a breakfast coming up. We have food. <laughs> Um, and so that's it for announcements. Uh, it just leaves offering. Uh, so I was looking through and uh, found Proverbs 19:17. It says, "Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and He will repay him for his deed." So when we are giving, uh, we're putting God in debt to us, according to this. And I don't know about you, but God's credit score is probably a lot better than mine. <laughs> and uh, people, they you. You, you lend money to get a return on your investment. That's why lenders are in business, because they actually make money on what they uh, give out. Uh, and God is gonna, doesn't say that he can. He says he will repay, and he will repay in the manner that we need, because he knows our needs better than we do. So uh, it's pretty exciting that you can put the God of all creation in debt to you just by being generous. So let's pray over the offering, and then we'll dismiss the children. Lord, we are just so blessed to live in such a beautiful, amazing valley here in the Bitterroot, God. And we, we want to be generous and give into this valley, Lord, and show that 
not only do we uh, appreciate the uh, blessing of being here, but we want to bless others that are here also, and we do that through giving. And Lord, we should give without even expectation of a return, but Lord, you are so good that you say that you will repay us for our deeds of generosity, God. And Lord, we are so, so thankful and so blessed that we have a Father that loves us so much that he would uh, challenge us in our generosity. God, we pray that you would bless this service today. We are so thankful for everybody that is here and that has come through these doors. Lord, we pray that uh, your, your word and your message uh, would impact our lives. In your son's name we pray, amen. amen. And you can give on the black boxes on the wall or at revivemt.org. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Steve. Hey, uh, real quick. So there's a women's Bible study on Tuesday night, and then there's also a women's study on Thursday in the afternoon from 1 to 3. And uh, uh, Christine Morton and Lauren Barthels, Lauren, Lauren just walked in. Uh, there she is. Um, uh, they are doing uh, a book called Women of the World by Jen Wilkin. You can get this on Amazon Prime for about $9. Uh, I would suggest, oh, sorry. I would suggest you just throw this away. No, I would suggest that you, if you want to attend that study, to order that this week. Um, get it in and then read the introduction of it. So not this coming Thursday, but next Thursday on their first meeting, they'll go over the introduction and start diving into this book. So um, let's be prepared. Women, you guys have all kinds of homework. Guys, we're just going to eat something on the 18th. So we're not shallow. We just like to eat. I'm shallow. <laughs> okay, I am too. Sorry. <laughs> hey, who's here at worship night on Friday night? Woo! Donna, come here. Come here. Yeah, you. Come here. Come here. This is Donna Rainwater. They've been coming for about six, eight months. Donna, tell me what uh, worship night was like for you. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, we came, and we were kind of sluggish and tired. And by the second song, we were so energized. And by the end of the night, I had no voice. <laughs> <laughs> we sang some amazing songs, and my soul was just filled. To yeah. the brim. It yeah. was a wonderful night, and I can't wait till the next one. Awesome. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So there's no better way to shake off the cares of this world than to worship a living king. First Peter 5, 7 tells us, give all your worries and cares to God. He cares about you. And worship is that practical, active way that we can do that, that we can just give those cares to him. And that's why we worship every time we come to church. If you're not used to a church that worships, that's why we do it. It's an opportunity for us to prepare our hearts for what he's got to say to us. It's an opportunity for us to worship him, edify him, glorify him. And it's a way for us to just cast our cares upon him. And like Donna says, she can't wait till the next one, October 29th. Put it on your calendar right now. It'll be the next worship night here at Revive Bitterroot. So I was thinking about the series that we're going through, that we went through this summer and we're still going through it. It says, Dress for Success. So as I was thinking about this, we've been learning how to put on the full armor of God. It's kind of been like a shopping spree, a three-month shopping spree, where we, we dive into the Word, we go through the Word, and we find gems that allow us that, that actually become the undergarments that allow us to put on the armor. Hopefully, you've been reading through Ephesians. Uh, I challenged us to do that each week because getting that in our spirit. And really, the Holy Spirit will share stuff with you right where you're at. I mean, that's, that's what's so interesting about the Word of God is I can read a passage of Scripture and it can speak to me in a totally different way than it speaks to you because that's the Holy Spirit and that's where you're at. It doesn't mean we interpret it different. It just means it speaks to us where we're at in our life at that point in time. Hope that your mind's being renewed to the truth of who you are in Christ. 
But before we suit up, we still have a few truths that Paul wants us to know before going into battle. Some of you may have seen a post that I put on Facebook, on Revive Bitterroot's Facebook site uh, last week. And it said, there isn't a mask big enough to protect us from everything going on in the world today. Instead, we need to suit up with the whole armor of God. That's exactly why God has us studying Ephesians, figuring out who we are in Christ, what promises God has given us, what we can stand upon, how we're to relate to one another, and how we're to live in this world, so that when the world throws something at us, which it's going to throw stuff at us, it does every day, that we can stand strong. We can go into the battle ready with the full armor of God protecting us. Today I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. And I was going to skip right straight through this. I was going to, I was going to skip this section and go straight to uh, the passage at the end of 5 and beginning of 6. It talks about relationships in the home. But I really felt like God said, don't skip it. And to be honest with you, I'm not a, oh, what's the word, Vern, when you go through, when you preach um, scripture after scripture? Um, uh, expository, yes. Um, I, 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 I'm more of a topic, and so this is this has been interesting, kind of going topical but expository through through Ephesians. Did I say something wrong? Oh, okay, uh, maybe I said that wrong. Um, but and so, but it's been good for me, I think, and hopefully it's been good for you guys as well. Um, I also thought, well, it's opening week in archery season, so there's probably some people of the male persuasion that needs to hear about family relationship. <laughs> Can I get an amen, women? <laughs> That's right. So let's read Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 15, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's continuing his encouragement to the Gentiles here uh, in the church of Ephesus to be careful how they live. He's done this throughout his letter to them. The word live in the Greek is peripateo, and it means to walk about or to go about or to make due use of opportunities. See, we're to walk about in life every day in our daily lives as an example of what Christ has done in us. And we're to be fully dressed in the armor of God so that we can be effective in what God calls us to do on a daily basis. Paul has prepared us throughout Ephesians to be ready to put on the armor of God. Verse 1 and 2 of chapter 2 reminds us of who we were, or uh, uh, reminds us where we came from. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, and you lived and you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. But the good news is, if we're following Jesus, we're no longer slaves to sin and deception. Verse 17 and 18 of chapter 4 says, With the Lord's authority I say this, Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from life. God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against Him. Paul reminded us in chapter 2 verse 10 of our true identity. And our calling. It says, For we are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. Do you believe that? Ben, you are God's masterpiece. I mean, think about a masterpiece. When we think, think of a painting, you know, like a Van Gogh or something, we're like, oh, that's a masterpiece. That's amazing. It's, it's valuable. It's incredibly valuable. People stand back and look amazed at it, of, of the artistry and the talent that went into it. That's how he looks at each one of us. David, he looks, stands back and goes, oh, look what I created. 
Isn't it amazing? That's, you're God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things He has planned for us long ago. The beginning of chapter 4 begs us to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. And again in chapter 5, Paul reminds us of where we came from and who we are now as followers of Christ. Verse 8 reads, For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of the light, for this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Really, the only way to reflect that light is through love, is loving people. Paul writes in verse 2 of chapter 5, Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma of God. So throughout Ephesians, Paul is telling the Ephesians, uh, the, the people of Ephesus, how to live, where they came from, who they are now in Christ, how to relate to one another. Those first couple of verses that we read earlier says, don't be foolish, live wise, make use of every opportunity. Kind of reminded me of my childhood, of my dad. He would look at me and go, did you do the right thing? Were you wise? Did you make the wise decision? No, dad, I was 16. I don't think about my decisions at 16, right? But the reason why... The difference, I guess, between now and when I was 16 is I understand the why now. I understand the why. See, the why in Paul's encouragement to not be foolish, but rather wise in all that we do and to make good use of every opportunity is because we live in evil days. He knows what it's going to take to do battle with the enemy. He knows what it's going to take to stand Verse 16 in the Amplified Bible puts it this way. Make the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. The Greek word in this verse means to buy up at the marketplace. I thought that was interesting, to buy up at the marketplace. So it's an active word. It's not a passive word. It's not where we're just going through life passive, but we're actively buying it up. It's aggressive. Opportunities regarded as a commodity to be used by believers. Also, Paul indicates that wisdom is needed to govern our use of our time. My King James Study Bible says in its notes, to use time wisely and do not squander it. Be certain you will give an account of how you use God's gift of time. Who else is convicted when you read that? Yeah. Holy Toledo. I didn't need to read that note. I'd have rather not seen that. I mean, I don't know about you, but wow. Will I give an account of how I used my time? Man, that's, it's, it's, it's challenging. Because in today's society, we're really good at wasting time, aren't we? I mean, okay, maybe I'm just preaching to myself. Maybe I'm really good at wasting time. But statistics show that nearly all of us spend nearly four hours a day on our phone. And we spend another three hours a day streaming videos, either on our phone or on television, on a screen. That's seven hours of time wasted. I mean, I understand there's Bible apps, there's things you can do on your phone that's not a complete waste of time. All right. But a lot of it is just waste of time. And I ask people all the time, when I walk up to somebody, when you walk up to somebody and say, hey, how you doing? What is the number one response? I'm good. That, that's actually probably number one. Number two is I'm tired. All right? Well, you just wasted seven hours on the phone. Put the phone down and go to sleep. We need to go to sleep more. <sighs> Amen. <laughs> Not now, though, David. Wait another 20 minutes or so. Okay. <laughs> Neil Postman suggests that as a culture, we are amusing ourselves to death. That is distracting ourselves into a bland, witless superficiality. 
And at youth camp, we heard this quote from Ryan Dueck. It says, We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. That was a really, really, let's leave that up there. That was a really convicting line, um, quote at camp. And they were talking to the youth, but they were talking to me too. Because I have realized that most of my time, when I'm not focused on something, is I'm picking up the phone. Mindlessly. I've lost the ability or the art or whatever you want to call it of pondering, of just thinking, of just sitting and looking, just asking God, what do you have to say to me? I'm constantly doing something on my phone so that I don't avail my mind to him. I don't listen. I don't think. I don't. I mean, it's really hard. The other day I was, I was grilling something on the grill and I sat down um, on a, on chair and of course I grabbed the phone. I went, no, 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 no. I'm just gonna set it down. I'm gonna look around. Wow, mountains are pretty, you know? It's like what what am I missing? I'm missing God speaking to me on a daily basis because I'm basically doing I'm distracting myself into spiritual oblivion. And I was really convicted of that. So I'm working on it as personal. Personally, I'm working on setting my phone aside more often, being where I'm at, being in the moment. Um, being not, still and know that I am the Lord. Yep, being still and knowing that I am the Lord. We Americans spend seven hours a day on our phone or watching TV, but a 2020 report states that committed Christians only, only 9% of committed Christians read their Bible daily. That's the lowest figure in decades. How can we expect to be fully equipped warriors dressed for success in the full armor of God if we spend seven hours a day amusing ourselves and virtually no time in the instruction manual of life? Ooh, it's getting quiet. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself here, people. Okay, I'm not up here going, look at me, how great I am, how great I'm doing. I'm preaching to myself. But I really felt like this was the word. This is what, again, just like two weeks ago, this was not the direction I thought this message was going when I started. But this is how God led me. And I really think that we need to start putting down our phones and diving into his word and listening to him. Amen. Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, talks about the life-giving word. It says, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does, does you no good? Listen to me, and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the finest food. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love I promised to David. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, it's not meaning our Subway sandwich. It's meaning our daily dose of His Word, His bread that we can digest, that we can dive into. It's give me understanding of what I'm going to read today. Help me understand what you have for me. Jesus exemplified this after his time in the wilderness. He had spent 40 days without food. I'm telling you, whew, I'd be hungry. I'd be really hungry. 40 days. I'm like 40, like 40 hours without food and I'm hungry. Like, if Satan can't afford four hours without food, I'm hungry. Okay, I'm hungry. But Satan comes and says to him, if you're the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I, think about this. He had turned twice in the Bible, he had turned fishes and loaves into enough to feed tens and thousands of people. This was not a task for him. This was not a difficult thing. 
This was him. This was Satan, like going to Russ and say, hey, pound that nail in. Russ was like, sure. You know, it was easy. But Jesus knew what he needed. It was not earthly bread, but he needed life-sustaining bread. He needed the word of God. Jesus stands strong in the full armor of God by returning to the truth of Scripture. And in verse 4 of chapter 4, he quotes Deuteronomy 8, 3. He says, but Jesus told him, no, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, that's a great example when Satan's coming against us and he's speaking into your, into your, into your mind about how worthless you may be or the mistake you just made and what God thinks about you. That's why we've got to have the Word of God deep down so we can turn around and say, no, this verse says I'm a child of the living God. This verse says that I'm His special possession. This verse says I'm His masterpiece. We need to return Satan's lies with truth. See, it really is a mute, mute point for me to be up here each week if you're not in the Word every day. If you're not feeding your spirit, man, each and every day in the Word of God, then you're not putting on the full armor of God. And if you're not putting on the full armor of God, then you cannot stand against the devil's schemes. You'll be powerless. I mean, we can get filled up on Sunday. We can learn something on Sunday. But if you're like me, by Wednesday, <laughs> I'm pretty empty already. I need to be reading daily. If you're going to put on the full armor of God, then we must put down our cell phones and pick up the living word of God. We must live life wisely and make the most of every opportunity. How can you make the most of every opportunity when you walk around like this? How about that next picture? Got any students in here today? I do. I got a few students in here. I'm talking directly to you guys now. I challenge you to be the generation that puts your cell phone down and reconnects with their friends on a personal level. Be the generation that takes time to make a difference in your friend's life. In person, not in text. I mean, your friends are committing suicide at an unprecedented rate. Why is that? Because of this. Because nobody's talking to one another. Nobody's looking into each other's eyes and realizing that they're empty, that they need somebody, that they need a friend. That they, need, they want to be known. They want to be seen. They want to be heard. They desperately need to know you and their God loves them. We all need to make the most of every opportunity God gives us, and that means being present in the moment, not distracted on our phones or, or computer all the time. And we need to be filled up with His Word so that we can minister to those around us when God gives us those opportunities. This is what 2 Peter 3, 16-17 tells us. It says, All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. We cannot make the most of every opportunity without time spent in God's Word. If you can't see where you're going, or you're confused about God, what God wants you to do, or where He's leading you, Put down the cell phone and pick up this Bible. Psalms 119, 105, 104 and 105 says, your, your commandments give me understanding. No wonder I hate every false way of life. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light to my path. Again, I know that cell phones, there's a lot of good in cell phones. Uh, right after church, we're leaving to go to Phoenix. Um, and I'm going to use that phone uh, to get directions. And that's good. That's okay. You know, 
I have a Bible app on there, and I use it a lot, and that's okay. I'm not saying that we uh, phones are evil, but I do believe that we've bowed at the altar and the idol of phones um, a little too much. It was reported after the withdrawal from Afghanistan that people were being executed. They were going door to door and they were looking at cell phones and if they found the Bible app on their phone, they were being shot. And I don't know if that was really confirmed or not, but I I believe it could be taking place. What if that happens here in America? And I know you're thinking that'll never happen here in America. There's no way. It'll never happen. But it could. What happens if Apple and Samsung all of a sudden decides that those Bible apps are no longer, that they're hate speech? And now all of a sudden they pull them off your phone. Right, right, right like that. Does everybody have a Bible? Does everybody have a written word? I think it's important. If you don't come to me and I'll buy you one. But you need to have a Bible. And I don't spend as much time in the pages as I do on the computer and my phone. And I'm not, trying, I'm not saying that that's necessarily bad, but make sure you have one of these. Because if we ever do get to the point where, and we may, and the Bible, I mean, there's, if you read this word, you know, there's stuff coming. And we need to be prepared, and we need to have it in our heart as well. Youth, if you want to stand strong and stay pure while you're, while your other friends are compromising, get in the Word. Psalms 119 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your Word. That's the instructions right there. It's right there. God wants us to put on the full armor. He wants us to stand against every scheme of the devil, to be victorious. And He wants us to impact this world for Him. How can we do it? By being in His Word every day. By getting our daily nourishment from His divine Word that is alive and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. I love this quote from Chuck Swindoll. It says, To be used of God, is there anything more encouraging, more fulfilling? Perhaps not. But there is something more basic. To meet with God. To linger in His presence to shut out the noise of the city and in quietness give him the praise he deserves. Before we engage ourselves in his work, let's meet him in his word, in prayer, and in worship. If you don't already read the Bible on a daily basis, I just challenge you this week to start. And it can just be 10 minutes a day. It really can be 10 minutes a day. And he will build that passion and that desire for more. Ephesians might be a good place to start if you haven't been reading. And I, and I ask you to make a commitment to do it first. I know it's so tempting to roll over in bed, grab that cell phone, check Facebook, a few Instagrams, what Dakota post already. Oh, look at that. First day of school. That's sweet. Um, you know. Check my email. But man, by that time, my mind's buzzing. I got a list of things to do. And normally, I just jump out of bed and I'm gone. No time in the Word. Do it first. Do it first. And I pray that you do it not out of obligation. Not out of, not out of like, oh, my pastor made me feel bad this week. I got to read the Word. I don't want you doing it that. I want you doing it out of your love for God. To learn more about Him. To commune with Him desire to be fed by the Father, to know His will, to commune with Him. I encourage you to digest the life-sustaining bread this week and see what God will do in your life through His Word. So if the worship team will come back up. Father, I thank You for Your Word. Thank you for your word that is never changing. Your word that is truth. Your word that we can anchor our lives on. Your word that is 
life-sustaining bread. Father, I ask you that you will help it come alive to us, to each individual. Holy Spirit, that you will speak to each individual as they open their Bible or open their Bible app this, this week and they begin to read that the words will jump off the page and will become real to them, will become life-giving, sustaining bread, encouraging, and that they, when they come back next week, there'll be testimonies of how you spoke to them through your word this week. Lord, build a fire within each one of us, a desire to be more in to your word, Father. And Lord, help us to have self-control, to put down our phones and to ponder and to, to meditate upon your word and to listen for your voice, Lord, to be still and know that you are God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here at Revive Bitterroot, we always take a few minutes after the sermon to ask Holy Spirit what he's saying to us specifically, to respond to him. We don't want to just be people that run out of here and leave what we heard right here in this room. You can stand and sing. You can sit and pray. If you need prayer, please find someone. Mom and dad are right over here. They'd love to pray with you. We're going to sing a song or two, but this is your time with Holy Spirit, with God. Spirit, break out our walls down. Spirit, break out. Heaven come down, Spirit break out, break our walls down, Spirit break out, Heaven come down.
our whole life. So we surrender. Let's sing revival. Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I.
that we're serving you, Lord, not our own selfish ambitions, not our own desires, Lord, that we give the control that we want to retain, that we want to grasp, that we want to hold on to, and we give that up to you. And we realize that the words today that were spoken, that we're living in evil times right now. There's things that are burning us and hurting us and ripping those scabs up. And as we become more aware that we are not in control, that those of us that are still holding on just release that control unto you our families, in our relationships, in our marriages, in our mournings, in our sufferings. I pray, Lord, that this week that we are renewed in your spirit, that you fill us, that we're reminded that we give that control up to you as much as we want to hold it and we open that hand and release it. You're in control, Lord. I pray all this in your son Jesus' name.